Almighty God, we praise thy name for having heard us pray, for having freed us from our chains one year ago today. We thank thee for thy arm has stayed foul despotism sway and made Columbia's district free one year ago today. Give us the power to withstand oppression's baneful fray that right might triumph as it did one year ago today. Give liberty to millions yet neath despotism's sway that they may praise thee as we did one year ago today. O oh, guide us safely through this storm, bless Lincoln's gentle sway, and then we'll ever praise thee as one year ago today. One year ago today by John Willis Menard. Welcome, everyone. Um, uh, we, we're so sorry that Nika Giovanni's not here tonight, but we do have something special planned, so thank you for coming. Um, yes, first of all, we'd just like to introduce the, um, the project to give a little bit of context to the readings, but the poems really are at the center of, um, of the event. So what we're planning is to read a series of, of poems, um, give you a tiny bit of context, and then um, ask ask really what, what, what strikes you and to start a discussion about, about what the poems um, might mean uh, today. Um, Liz, do you want to start with uh, a little bit of context about newspaper poetry and, and why it mattered? <laughs> The piece that, that Kyle started with was published in a newspaper, the Anglo-African, which is the basis uh, for all of the, the poems that you'll hear tonight. And it was published, um, as, the, as the title would suggest, a year following the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, and what we, our edition foregrounds and what we hope that the event this evening foregrounds is that poetry was a vital, played a vital role in the public discourse of the Civil War. And these poems, public, pub, poems published in newspapers were not a novelty. They were really significant in all, all of the conversations surrounding the Civil War, including emancipation and the participation of African Americans in battle and um, all, and so, sub, um, that selection of poems, and so we see these poems as a sampling, but also as representative then of the of the really significant role that poetry and newspaper poetry played um, as one more aspect of the Civil War. So it's not just all all battles, but the the role that that literature and poetry in particular played um, in in the action of the Civil War. Mm. Um, it might be worth adding a couple of lines about the Anglo-African newspaper. Um, this was a New York-based weekly newspaper. Uh, it was launched by Thomas Hamilton in uh, July of 1859. And during the Civil War, it was managed by his brother, Robert. Um, Thomas played a big part in the, the business of the paper, but Robert was the named editor. Um, and it, it continued until December of 1865 uh, when, it, when it closed. So um, the Anglo-African is recognized as a really important source uh, for historical information about what was going on at this time. But the poems have been neglected, um, and some of them uh, haven't been, um, we, we, as far as we know, performed um, since they were, they were um, recorded in the newspaper. So it's kind of a special moment to hear them uh, it, with voices out loud. So um, will we go ahead and begin reading? So the first poem you're going to hear is The Black Volunteers by Fran Francis Jackson Copin, and it was published in the Anglo-African on the 9th of May, 1863. Francis Jackson Copin was born into slavery in the District of Columbia, and she was emancipated by her aunt before her 10th birthday. She moved to New England, combined work with study, and eventually, uh, just before the Civil War, uh, joined Oberlin College. So she was at Oberlin throughout the Civil War. And there she, um, she did all sorts of amazing things. She, she was on the gentleman's course for one thing. She studied Greek and Latin mathematics. 
Uh, she championed African-American enlistment. She supported the Anglo-African. She ran evening classes for freed people. One of the poems that she uh, contributed is, uh, is, uh, is this one uh, that Holly's going to read now. Right. And there's a Latin phrase at the end of the poem, so I just wanted to give the translation before I do the poem. It's Sic Itur Ad Astra, which means the path to the stars. But I think in our contemporary parlance, we might say, keep your eyes on the prize. <laughs> the Black Volunteers. We welcome, we welcome our brave volunteers. Filling your caps to the breeze, boys, and give them three cheers. They have proven their valor by many a scar, but, but their godlike endurance has been nobler by far. Think ye not that their brave hearts grew sick with delay when the battle cry summoned their neighbors away, when their offers were spurned and their voices unheeded and grim prejudice vaunted their aid was not needed till some pious soul full of loyal devotion to whom flesh and muscle were more than a notion proposed that in order to save their own blood as drawers of water and hewers of wood, they should use their black brothers. But the blacks couldn't see what great magnanimity prompted the plea and they scouted the offer as base and inglorious for they knew that through God they should yet be victorious. But alas, for our country, her insolent horde has melted like snow in the glance of the Lord. I, the face of the nation, grew ghastly and white when the angel of death crossed her sill in the night and her firstborn were slain. Then she bowed her proud head while in sackcloth and ashes she mourned for her dead. Let her weep for her martial pride, weep for her noblest. The southern plains reek with the blood of her boldest. Yet her pride is not humbled by what she has borne. Tis necessity's goad that is urging her on to enlist you, my brothers. Tis natural, we read, to hate whom we've injured by word or by deed. But God's ways are just. His decrees are immutable, though often to us they seem dark and inscrutable. He meant not that slavery should always last, and over his people its dark shadow cast. Now, freedom stands holding with uplifted face her hand dipped in blood on the brow of our race. Attest it, my country, and never again by this holy baptism forget we are men. Nor dare, when we've mingled our blood in your battles, to sneer at our bravery and call us your chattels. Our ancestors fought on your first battle plains, and you paid them right nobly with insult and chains. You pitied not even the sad and forlorn. You pensioned their widows and orphans on scorn. In your hour of bitterest trial and need, you have called us once more. To, vo to your voice we give heed. No longer your treacherous faith will discuss. But let God be the witness between you and us. We have stout hearts among us, as well do you know, that ne'er quailed before danger or shrank from a foe. They have come at your bidding in dangers to share and that which is grander to do and to dare. Then away to the battlefield, brave volunteers. We'll not sadden your parting with womanish tears. Fling out to the breezes your banner of right and under its broad folds assemble your might. Go liberty, honor, I, all things most dear, are entrusted to you to defend and to clear from the stain of oppression whose poisonous breath is less welcome to us than the black wing of death. Though millions assail ye, yet fear not their might. They shall vanish like mist in the sun's ruddy light, for God will go with you. His word has been spoken. His gleaming blade never in battle was broken. With him as your leader, 
your cause will fail never. Sic etur ad astra, your watchword forever. That was uh, really powerful. I love the way you read that, Holly. Um, one of the things that strikes me about this poem is that it's written by a female poet, yet she you know, says, we are men. She sort of inhabits the voice of the male soldier. I wanted to just say what struck me in the poem, and I wanted to open it up for a few minutes and see if there was anything that struck you. Um, I'm always um, really struck by the audaciousness of women during this period. And one, one of the things that struck me about this poem was her anger and her um, indignation. Um, and so there's that line where, and, and she's speaking in this you voice to um, this white audience, right? And it switches towards the end of the poem, right? She says, you pity not even the sad and forlorn. You pension their widows and orphans on scorn. Um, and then she says, you know, no longer your treacherous faith will discuss, but let God be the witness between you and us. So she says, you know, if let's, you know, we're going to, you know, make this pact that we're going to go forward, but, and God is going to be the witness to this. Um, and so when I read this poem, I, you know, I just thought to myself, you know, wow, you know, I love the um, forthrightness with which she's expressing her indignation. But I wanted to know if anybody heard in anything in there that, that sort of stood out at them. I know it's a long poem, but was there anything you heard? One of the things, um, if, if um, sorry to jump in, is that, that strikes me is, is her sort of loyally language, a little bit attest, attest it, my country, let God be the witness. You know, legal, she's, she's using, using sort of a, a legal legal language and, and making a pact that will, um, that will be tight, that, that won't be broken, she, she's, um, and, and when I was interested that you, know, you picked out that moment, said, forget we are men, of course you think, well, it's, it's gendered, but also um, men as um, mankind, human, human, a much um, a broader reference for that, um, that she's staking this claim mm -hmm. for. Um, and, and I think that's, um, it's a really remarkable um, public speech. Um, as you said, mm -hmm. she's, you, um, us, sh she's taking on the role of spokesperson here, mm -hmm. um, I think. Um, yeah. I had a, a thought, and if <coughs> no one from the audience, I was just thinking about this history that keeps repeating, this unfortunate history, so that whether it was a Revolutionary War or the Civil War, the Vietnam War, you know, black soldiers going to fight on behalf of America and then coming back. And even now, you know, in the midst of the Black Lives Matter movement, but yet there's still um, black men and women overseas fighting on behalf of America. And then what do we get when we come back? And it's improved, but it, you know, when you really start thinking about that history, and, and soldiers literally coming back to no jobs, to, um, to still facing the same types of discrimination. It's, it's just awful. And the indignation that she felt then during the Civil War, you know, during the 1860s, and here we are in 2014, still basically trying to have that same conversation. Like, you, you owe us this much. is very brave. I was wondering whether any repercussions came to her that we know of for um, for taking her stand. Uh not not that we know of. Um, uh, there was a there was a movement um that that championed African American enlistment um at Oberlin and and beyond. Um so in the Anglo-African this is absolutely of a part with what other um spokespeople are saying other commentators. So um I, I I don't th there weren't um, repercussions in in for her in her context. It would have been a a, a different matter if maybe she'd said it in the, what what she says here. Like um, African American uh, men take up arms um, in uh, at a different in a different place, different time. But at this moment, you know, after the um, African American enlistment uh, has 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 begun, the movement has begun. Um, I I think that her. her um, she's very prescient, very uh, shrewd, but
but she supports it and and that's that's what other people are, are doing at this moment you know you think of frederick Douglass, right call, call to arms um I, I i read this alongside um his his famous speeches and articles uh, yeah. uh, i was just going to say that there's a there's a threat in there that there's going to be a reckoning here mm. That's right. And, and you know, it's courageous. interesting because so for so long, um, when we studied African American history, um, and when we thought of Afri you know, sort of in our minds, when we thought of African American history, we thought of this sort of turn the other cheek, sort of, you know, saintly endurance of, you know, years and years of oppression. But when you go back and you dig, there were always um, echoes of these kinds of um, indignant voices, you know? And so one of the wonderful, I think, results of a project like um, what these two scholars have done is to sort of continue to unearth those voices, because there, there always have been, you know, voices of indignation and um, of, I'm sorry, of resistance, exactly, thank you for giving me the word. And I, and I and, and, but it's still, even though I know that, you know, it's still, does something to me when I hear it, you know, it's in, in, and especially um, when it's a voice that we, a name that we don't recognize, you know, a sort of a voice that's sort of been um, buried in the past. So it still kind of gives me that thrill. Should, should we move on to the second, the second piece? Our second piece is the poem that is actually on the handout that you have, and it um, is The Slave to His Star by William Slade. This was published in the Anglo-African on September 19th, 1863 which was almost a year to the day after Abraham Lincoln issued the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. And so the poem is in a way um, a, a recognition of the fact that although the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation had been issued and since then the Emancipation Proclamation, there was actually still quite a ways to go, particularly since slaves in loyal border states had not been freed. And of course the author for, for this poem is perhaps one of the more well-known figures among our poems tonight, but he's not been known as a poet in the past. So William Slade was the lead steward in the Lincoln White House. He was um, a member of the kind of local African-American elite of the, of the period. He was a, a member of the 15th Street Presbyterian Church and a leader in the community, was friends with Elizabeth Keckley, and with Keckley and his wife participated in the efforts of the Contraband Relief Association. So, Kyle. Bright star of all stars beloved, to thee I turn from dreams erewhile, far up in God's free heaven unmoved. I saw by night thy ceaseless smile, lighting a path of hope afar, freedom's high watchfire for the free, steadfast and solitary star. I felt that fire was lit for me. I gaze upon thy northern light that never fails and falters never, but hang far over day and night, from heaven's wall shine down forever. I seem to hear a voice of God speak through the silence down to me. Thy feet are strong, thy way is broad. The star shall be my path for thee. Hiding in darkened caves by day, with toiling footsteps through the night, to me came down thy guardian ray, a burning lamp, a shining light. The red sea of my pilgrim road whose parted waves hung threateningly. I traversed while that beacon glowed, and freedom's fettered slave is free. Star of the slave, crown of the free, the eternal midnight's dearest gem. My race from midnight look to thee, as Bethlehem's star art thou to them, forever dear their light above their path below through wood and wave, their evening star of trust and love, thou pilot of the pathless slave. I think we're going to do two poems and then talk about them. So hold that star in your mind. <laughs> 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 
also, um, do you read home again? Yeah. So, okay. so the next poem, um, we kind of, uh, we've, is Home Again by John Willis Menard, who was the author of the, the poem that we opened the evening with um, one year ago today. Menard was a, f a free African-American um, in, in Washington. He was a proponent of emigration and colonization, and that is a theme of, of this next poem. And it's a poem that Menard wrote um, upon coming back. He was sent on a fact-finding mission to evaluate Honduras as a site for emigration or colonization. And this is the poem that he wrote um, upon seeing the United States again at that, at that moment. I am come home again to my native land from the far off bounding sea, once more to my own dear hills and dales with a spirit light and free. Once more to my native scenes and skies, once more to the loved one's home, once more to my placid streams and lakes, I merrily, merrily come. Once more amid the din and clash of swords, mid the roar of musketry, where the daring sable warrior strikes for God and liberty. What's more amid the flood of blow and tears, where the cannon's iron voice speaks freedom on the southern plains and makes the slave rejoice. Once more to my dark-eyed maiden love to make her red cheeks glow. Once more to the angel heart I won in days of long ago. So I, want, I wanted to ask you all, you know, so the first poem, William Slade, who was a steward in the White House, and you know, when I read that, of course, I thought of the butler, right? Who, you know, but you know, he was a member of the African American elite in Washington at that time. And I wondered if there was a connection between his hopefulness and his ability to class ascend. I mean, he wasn't obviously at the highest echelons of American society, but certainly at the highest ech echelons of African American society. And so there was something about that slave to his star poem that's just so hopeful to me. You know, he says in the opening uh, stanza, he says, um, I saw by night thy ceaseless smile lighting a path of hope of afar, freedom's high watchfire for the free, steadfast and solitary star. I felt that fire was lit for me. You know, um, I mean, obviously there's just something wonderful in the hopefulness of that, but I did um, think about the connection between um, his success and his hopefulness. Yes. So as you, as you're reading it, I, I took it to connect it. He connected it to the Underground Railroad, mm -hmm. um, and that really made a lot of sense, knowing that they needed the North Star right. to use as a guide to to arrive at freedom. So on the other hand, though, I agree with you too. I think there may have been something about just the ability to rise above what what um, slaves faced. Mm -hmm. The connection to the the long tradition of the North Star in um, in abolition literature um, and that, that that theme. I think what's significant about this poem is you, you know it's 1863, um, we've had DC Emancipation, the Emancipation Proclamation, and yet Slade is still saying that North Star is still really significant. Um, and so even though it is there is um, optimism and hopefulness, it's still a reminder that we you know there are people enslaved in the South who still require the light of that star. And then in the second poem, Home Again. Um, you know, I think about the whole colonization project. I think of, you know, Henry Highland Garnett and then, you know, like, but I'm just wondering, you know, the, the thing about um, the colonization project from the perspective of Menard in this poem and, and from the perspective of those African Americans who were in support of the project, it was the idea behind it was a kind of homecoming. Let's go somewhere where we... Um, one, to return to our homeland, obviously, but also a place where we are in control of our own selves. You know? But then I think of um, the ideas of white colonists, colonizationists, who 
viewed it as a sort of answer to the question of what do we do with the slaves? What do we do with the millions of black people in this country? Yeah, let's send them back to Africa. I always just think about um, the juxtaposition of those two projects that were sort of wrapped up in the same cloth. But, but I, as I listened to this poem, um, it, it, it felt so wonderful and nostalgic and... I think it's it's um, the I like the the pairing there because they're two journeys, aren't they? The sort of yes, the the right. um, movement um, following the North Star, and the the return, and it's sort of an interesting moment um, home again, um, because as you said, you know we've, we've um, had the Emancipation Proclamations. Uh, Menard refers to the the, the Sable Warriors, you know, African American enlistment and. He's, he's thinking about what that might mean um, in terms of rights. Like, okay, so maybe, maybe this is a moment where he's changing his mind, having having uh, seen Honduras and, and thought about that as a possibility. But you know, there are new possibilities opening up um, in in uh, the United States, and so it's it's a sort of a transitional moment, I think, for him, and, and that's sort of reflected in this in this journey. Um, the, the, the sort of uh, trope of the journey, I think. Hi. Um, in response to the um, first poem, what, what resonated with me, the spiritual base of it and how he hung onto the North Star to give him hope mm -hmm. and to give him guidance towards freedom. But then also what came to mind was, after she spoke, um, the young lady here, is uh, we three kings of Orient are, how they followed the North Star um, to get where they were going. So mm -hmm. it was good, though. Yeah, and fits, of course, with um, you know Slade being a very active member of of the of the church, and so I think it's absolutely yeah. I, I want to say on, on that note too that reading all of these poems uh, really put me in the context of thinking about the battle over slavery, not so much the Civil War specifically, but the battle over slavery as one of, you know, religious ideology. And you think about the way that the Bible was used to justify slavery. And then, you know, it's, it's a very, um, you know, sharp, sh strategic uh, move in the poem where Slade equates himself, you know, to the Israelite crossing the Red Sea. It's like, you know, you're using this part of the Bible to say this is who I am, but I'm going to use this part to say actually this is who, who I am. And, and, and like <laughs> yeah. both, you know, using the book against uh, each other and that's ab that's absolutely a, 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 a strategy that that um we see again and again in in, in the poems yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i um i wanted to say one thing about home again and just relating it to my own personal experience i think there's something for many african americans and many people have written about it james baldwin in particular comes to mind this idea that when you are black in America, that experience is so fraught that you often don't feel American until you leave and then return. And then it's like this understanding of, oh yes, this is my home. Mm -hmm. I am American, you know, and he's saying this is my native land. And it, that really struck me. Should we move on to the yeah. next one? Okay. <coughs> So the, the fourth poem is um, by Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, um, probably the, the most well-known of, of, our, of our poets. Um, it's called The Sin of Akan, and it was published in the Anglo-African on 12th December of 1863. Um, I'm sure everyone here is, is familiar with, with um, Harper. She was an activist, orator, lecturer, um, and, and poet. Um, I'd, I'd just like to give you a little bit of context for the, the scriptural story. Um, in scripture, uh, Joshua sent his men to attack Ai. They were defeated um, because one of their number had disobeyed the divine injunction uh, to leave Jericho's spoils untouched. Achan um, stole and hid the riches reserved for God, who responded to Joshua's prayers uh, with a command to sanctify the people. There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until ye take away the accursed thing from among you. When Achan was discovered by Joshua, he and his family were put to death. 
In Harper's analogy, the accursed thing that prevents the union uh, from triumphing is, is slavery. Um, so Lincoln, she's suggesting, is no Joshua. So it's kind of a, a really uh, pointed uh, critique, I think. And it's worth saying that this poem isn't really talked about in, in, um, amongst Harper's works. So we, we know um, she's got all, all um, kinds of, of great work that is talked about, but this one hasn't been. And I wonder if it's something to do with her criticism, perhaps, of, of Lincoln. Yeah, so, I mean, we heard... Um, in, uh, in the uh, first poem, One Year Ago Today, gentle, Bless Gentle Lincoln. And, and this is a very different side of, of that kind of uh, debate that's going on in this, in, in this column. So, sorry. The poem begins with an epigraph. Will God give us peace and victory while one slave clanks his chain? The sin of Aachen. Night closed o'er the battling army, but it brought them no success. Victory perched not on their banners. Night was full of weariness. Flushed and hopeful in the morning, turned they from their leader's side. Routed, smitten, and defeated, came they back at eventide. Like the snow on ice-bound streamlets melting neath the south wind's breath, backward from the field of battle, flowed the bloody tide of death. Joshua, when he heard the tidings, how his valiant men had fled, rent his mantle, and each elder cast the dust upon his head. Then in tones of earnest pleading, Joshua's voice soon arose, tell us, O oh, thou God of Jacob, why this triumph of our foes? To his prayer, then came the answer. Why the host in dread did yield. T'was because a solemn trespass mid their tents did lie concealed. Clear and plain before his vision, with whom darkness is as light, lay the spoils that guilty Aachen covered from his brethren's sight. From their tents they purged the evil that had ruin round them spread. Then they won the field of battle, whence they had in terror fled. Through the track of many ages comes this tale of woe and crime. Let us read it as a lesson and a warning for our time. Oh, for some strong-hearted Joshua, faithful to his day and time, who will wholly rid the nation of her clinging curse and crime. Till she writes on every banner, all beneath these folds are free, and the oppressed and groaning millions Shout the nation's jubilee. So again, we, we go back to, you know, Kyle's mention of these um, poets taking biblical imagery and turning it into really what it should be, which is an argument for morality, right, and for doing what's right. But um, it's interesting that, you know, you mentioned that because of um, the fact that she's criticizing, you know, she's criticizing Lincoln, the government, saying that the Union Army is losing because of slavery's stain, because of the immorality of this secret that she says lies concealed in their tents. <laughs> Not secret, but, you know, yeah. terrible thing. That the, um, that the Civil War... Um uh, had, uh, I'm sure you all know uh, there's such a, a religious framework that it was um, both sides thought God was on their side but, um, and, and Harper is, is saying that he won't be on the Union side until, until they commit until to you do an right by us. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth saying that um, whilst th th this poem criticises um, the government, government policy uh, Harper uh, did receive Emancipation Proclamation um, as uh, an incredibly hopeful moment. This this was cause for celebration. Um, uh, I'll I'll just read you uh, one response uh, that she she wrote to William Still. Um, I know that all is not accomplished, but we may rejoice in what has already been wrought, the wondrous change in so short a time. So again, it's, it's about um, balancing perspectives at, at moments. Um, uh, yeah. But also the, the, ch 
challenge to yeah, not. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Very much the challenge to not, you know, <coughs> to not let it end there. Yes. Yeah. Oh, of yeah. course. Yeah. 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 Great. Any any other th things about the poem stand out to anyone? I know it's difficult if you don't have the poem yeah, right in I front of you, you, you know, but. That, uh, that, um, I sort of relearn every time we come to these poems was just how strong the voices of the women writers are. Yeah. And when we think about the literature of the Civil War, um, there was a, a scholar of Civil War literature who basically said, um, essentially, uh, Whitman aside, there was no, you know, sort of missed the moment. There's, there's no great literature that came out of the Civil War. Um, but I think that that sense of what is the great literature asks, is looking for the wrong things in the literature of the Civil War. And what we're seeing when we can, we're willing to return to, to works that were published in newspapers or poems that were so significant for everyone who was reading in them at the time, but maybe don't mesh with what we value in the aesthetics of poetry today, that's where we do find the, the great poetry of the Civil War. And I just, the, when we open the narrative in that way, we start to see that 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 great literature in many cases is um, coming from marginalized voices. It might be that looking in the wrong places as well. So you said yes. looking for the uh, for different things, but yeah, um, the verse in newspaper corners hasn't had a, a great literary reputation. Yes. Um, uh, but you know, also you you know, when we ask the question about great Civil War literature, it, even aesthetics aside, it never assumes that anything written by an African American is even included in that That's question. Right. You know, it's like I suppose um, Frederick Douglass's um, uh, journalism and and, and speeches uh, are kind of in included in part of that. But yeah, but like he's often seen as a sort, of, even though his his uh, narrative is published before the war, people don't really sort of lump him in as a Civil War, you know, author. Yeah. But I, you know, it's it's just an interesting question because you know I'm from the South, and you know when you grow up in the South, you grow up with the narrative that we lost the war, and I'm like, no, we won the war. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and you know, and I'm talking as a Southerner, you know. So, <laughs> you know, I think it's just really interesting, um, you know, um, to look at this literature and just see these sort of dueling narratives happening, you know, at the same exact time, even among. Uh, northern writers are not writing what these writers are writing, right? Like, we're just all supposed to be on the same side, but yet here's Harper criticizing the Union Army and saying, you deserve, basically, you deserve to lose because you are committing this great sin by not freeing slaves. And you've got, and she's, you know, keeping pressure on Lincoln to do what she needed him to do. Although by November of this year, we know that he's gone away in a cabin. He's, he's working on that proclamation, you know. But... Um, I love the fact, again, going back to the women, that she, you know, she is keeping, um, you know, her finger on him by saying, you know, you're going to lose everything if you don't do right, you know, so. Should we, should we move to the next one? How many more do we have? This is the last one. This is the last one? Okay. And then we can open up the questions. Awesome. Yeah, lots of discussion. Okay, so the, the last piece is um, called Equal Rights League Song, and um, it's attributed to J.R. Jr. in the newspaper, and that's John Randolph Jr. Um, published in the issue of 11th March 1865, so we've taken a leap um, from uh, 1863 through 1865 um, situation. It's very different. Um, just a, a little bit of context. John Randolph uh, Jr. was born into slavery near Washington, North Carolina. Um, Freedom arrived in the, with the Union Army. Um, and the National Equal Rights League was formed at the National Convention of Colored Men, held in Syracuse, New York, um, October of 1864. So delegate members were urged to pursue their legal, political, and education rights by establishing state and local leagues. So it's possible that Randolph's poem, um, with its... its um, Carolina Dateline uh, was addressing a local audience, saying, "Come on, let's rally, let's let's form form a, 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 an organization." But in the context of the Anglo-African newspaper, which had um, by this time a, a national circulation, you know, across um, north, south, east, and west, um, it, it it takes on a national sort of scale. So maybe keep that shift in mind. Come, 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 from the plain, hill, and dale, every city, 
town and vale, from the north, from the south, from west to ocean's mouth. Come ye men of every age, blooming youth and gray-haired sage, women fair, children rare, come our work to share. Rally, rally in our might, struggle on for equal right. Now's the, time, now's the day, this the way, come the call obey. Come, come, come. Let it not be forgot how oppressors fixed our lot, how they still at their will force the bitter pill. In God's holy book we read, these my people shall be freed. Be the cry of every breath, liberty or death. Rally, rally in our might, struggle on for equal right, Now's the day, this the way, these the words to say. Come, come, come. Every heart, every hand, join in one united band. No respite till the fight brings us equal rights. Not with sword or bayonet, by appeals or justice set. On the foe till he show injustice no more. Rally, rally in our might, struggle on for equal right. Now's the day, this the way, these the words to say. Come, 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 don't delay, come away. Join the leagues and with them stay. Never flinch, not an inch, till we gain the day. Then our children's children will love the leagues and bless us still. Who did fight that they might? have their equal right. Rally, rally in our might, struggle on for equal right. Now's the day, this the way, come the call, obey. Let's open it up. That is, Kyle, you did such a fantastic job. Yes, reading that and, 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 and you know, I just couldn't help but think this, this could be a rally song now, yeah. today, right? It's like perfect, it's perfect. And you know, they had this National Equal Rights League um, that these men established in 1864, and I think, well, let's just do this all again. Was, was there a hand there? Yeah? Yes. Uh, yeah, my name is Frank Smith, and I run the African American Civil War Museum here in DC, so. Uh, Thank you for I, coming. Yeah. yeah, sure. I just wanted to comment about the last poem. Uh, the war is over now, and the debate about the right to vote has become a big issue. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Lincoln is mom on this issue, by the way, of the right to vote until April 11th. And then he's assassinated on the 14th. Mm -hmm. So it's, the 11th is the first time he says that he thinks that the South ought to be brought back into the Union mm -hmm. with blacks having the full right to vote. He's referring to Louisiana. But the black community has been pushing this for a long time, particularly Douglas saying that blacks ought to have full citizenship and, 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 and equal rights, mm -hmm. meaning the right to vote, uh, once this war was over. By, by the time we get to this point, we know who's going to win the war. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we know already that, uh, that this, this whole question of equal rights has to be put back together. So mm -hmm. I think it's important uh, to know that the black community pushed this. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, it was the black community's vote that helped to reunite the country. Because once they were given the right to vote, and, they, they voted these southern states back into the union mm -hmm. as, as, as voters uh, uh, and, and helped to reunite them. So they needed these soldiers to win the war, and they needed the voters to bring the union back together. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's really a powerful poem, a powerful story. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for raising that, yeah, yeah. There's actually a, a, a moment in this poem that makes me uh, actually quite sad. Uh, towards the end, there's the lines, um, then our children's children will love the leagues and bless us still. And, you know, in the moment, I think about how, you know, our times are, are really defined in a way by the disconnect between the civil rights generation and their children. And, like, that didn't happen. It's like, you know, then our children, children will love the leagues and bless us still. <laughs> Not really. Um, and I guess it speaks to the importance of, you know, if you want to keep this momentum now, you have to maintain, um, you know, the rapport and the respect between the generations, because a lot get, lot gets lost when the next generation comes along and says, you know, to heck with y'all, this is now. Um, and it makes me wonder, well, you know, how did the children, you know, how did they respond to and sort of recognize that 
effort and sacrifice, you know. Thank you. Thank you for that. that that's, that's apropos for what I'm going to say. I, I'm a substitute teacher in the D.C. public school system, and it would be wonderful to have this kind of thing happen somewhere there, that no child left behind is not for our children. It does not help them feel good about who they are and where they come from. When I was in fifth grade, long, 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 long time ago, uh, in New York City, uh, when the teacher went around the room asking everyone where their family came from, um, and they said Europe, and they said France and England. And when it came to me, I, at th that day, I was the only one who had, dis uh, had uh, come from Africa, okay? Uh, the, my other, other black child in my class said he was from Jamaica. So, you know, <laughs> he didn't say Africa. So, but when it came to me, and I, I said, Africa, you know, because... <laughs> you know, it was such a terrible thing, and, and the children feel the same way today. Um, they need to be connected to this history that is so overwhelmingly good. You know, we were warriors. We did all kinds of beautiful, wonderful things in order to get to this place, and we have a long, long ways to go. And for them not to realize that is sad, because there are so many people who died and, and fought and lost their lives as a result of this struggle. So including my brother, he, he hasn't died, but Frank Smith put a lot of time, energy, and effort into the struggle and should not be forgotten. Thank you. I was thinking about, I think something that you said about um, the, the youth today, in the world, where the world is today, the country, this country in terms of, the country in terms of like race relations. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking, to, like, we're not taught this stuff in schools. Mm -hmm. We're not taught, like, I'm, I'm just sitting here because I'm going to study abolitionism and the Underground Railroad at Colgate this summer. It's so much stuff that we just don't know. We are never being taught. So when you're saying we want our youth to connect, we didn't know that we were writing revolutionary stuff. And I think today if we can take this and be at the forefront of this uh, Black Lives Matter movement and let kids know that your voice can be heard, it doesn't have to, it can be in the form of a, something already written. Like, we don't have to go back and recreate revolutionary. Mm -hmm. It's already done. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't want to create new anyway, right? It won't easy. It's already done. So I'm thinking, like, now we, at Oprah, somebody said, we don't have a leader. We got leaders. Yeah. They're mm -hmm. already here. Yeah. We just need to yeah. access it and get it out and let the youth know that it's already been done. These words, this, the fight for rights started back when the first slave ship landed, right? Mm -hmm. And the stuff is here. We, we know, but I'm just thinking how it's... It's, it's lost, mm -hmm. it's, it's uncovered, and, and our, our love and our, our, our love for it, we're not letting it spill over into our children. You it's know? true, and so sometimes I hear from people, you know, I have slavery fatigue, I don't want to hear anything about that era. You know, sometimes we get a little tired of it, and I think the reason people get tired of it, I don't get tired of it, is, is because, yes, it's that same sort of vic we were victims, we were beat, we were this and that, when this is, this is a story that we're talking about tonight of heroes of, you know, revolutionaries, of intellectuals, you know, and that's the history that we don't tell. Yeah, I know she has the I have to respond to that for just a second because I think this is, um, you know, we, in some ways we were producing this for scholars, but um, so it's really amazing to hear th this reaction to the, to the piece and, you know, the, the choice to make this, the, so there are almost 140 poems that we've recovered. This is a small sampling. And they're all available at the, the URL at the bottom of that handout. And we want, I mean, one, one goal for this in the way that we've made the materials available is that we want people um, to, take, to take these poems and to take the work that we've done and reuse them, remake them, just redo really important work with them, whether that's in literary studies or whether it's in a school. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so please, you know, these um, the way they're available, right? There, there are no restrictions really on what people can do with this work. So please take it and um, take it to the schools, and we will certainly, I mean, continue to do and like, like, look for really creative ways to get get these voices out there, which fits with right? these were in newspapers. It's fitting that tradition. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I was just going to say that the way that the curriculum is taught today is just that they don't like talking about all the messy parts about U.S. history. And, you know, we're taught in school, I'm in AP U.S. history right now, um, we're taught that Rosa Parks was just tired 
and that's why she didn't want to move. And it's no mention of the fact that they had planned this so that they could like make the movement widespread. And we're taught that you know the 19th the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920 has made all women able to vote, but that's not true. African American women couldn't vote until the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And we're taught all these things about history, like, you know, Columbus discovered America. No, America was here. There were people here. <laughs> like, the problem with U.S. history is that they, it's so Eurocentric and it's so popularized to make our country seem better than it is, but that's not helping anyone. I hope you're, you're wonderful. I hope you're correcting your teacher. I hope you're like the, the one that gets, yeah. Good. <laughs> she sh if you're correcting her, she shouldn't make her uncomfortable. So in the context of this, can you talk about how few African Americans at that time were, were able to read and write and how powerful in that context these words are? From what I understand, um, there were only 11% of African Americans were literate in 1860. Mm -hmm. um, that number might have been a little bit higher because if you were literate, obviously you had to conceal it. Um, but my guess is that it was no more than maybe 15%, you know. And so I think to have, did you have, do you have a different number? Or? No, I, I was just going to jump in. So okay, okay, okay. I was going to say, you know, um, and so, yes, to not only, not only are these um, poets literate, they're highly literate, you know, they're, they're absolutely, you know, highly educated. And, you know, often when we think about, like, talking about the African-American elite of, you know, sometimes you get sort of get into this sort of like, well, you know, there's always been an African-American elite, sort of this sort of class thing. But I'm less interested in the fact that, you know, they lived on our street or wherever, and more interested in these writings, to be honest with you. I'm more interested in them taking the education that they had and using it for purpose. But I don't know, what were you going to say? I, I was just going to um, sort of draw, draw attention to the, 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 the blurry line between song uh, spoken word and written poetry. So this is actually a song, the Equal Rights League song. Um, and I, I, I'm thinking of the context where song is such a powerful um, uh, medium um, and it doesn't require the, um, the, the text-based uh, text literacy that, that, that you're um, referring to. So I, I think there's... Um, there's maybe an artificial divide between songs and poems now that, that we don't sort of see in, in these papers. Um, uh, yeah, uh, so you, you can imagine the music, you could hear the music when, when it, was, it was spoken uh, so, so beautifully. Um, so I think that's another way to think of this, that it's not limited in, in maybe the senses that we, that we think when we encounter it as text. And I do think, uh, on that same note, how... Uh, poetry has been such an important part of the African-American oral tradition Absolutely. and linking that oral tradition back to African nations where there were always historians who memorized histories and recited those histories. And I think, you know, here in the U.S., I know my parents' generation, my grandparents' generation, they always memorized poems mm -hmm. and, and so that's a, another way of caring literacy yeah yeah so uh i'm a business manager for a tech company based out of silicon valley and i'm just visiting uh thank you so much Welcome. for sharing your time thank you <laughs> happy to be here and i was so galvanized by what you shared today especially with the audaciousness of the voices of the women i think it really reminds me of concepts of race, gender, and the arts of survival, and how poetry is such a medium for resistance, and how it enables women, and black women in particular, to have a way to voice their discontent and their indignation. So when I look at my Fortune 500 company, I don't see faces that look like me, I don't see women, and I don't see black people, and when they do come along, it's so rare that they say, I want to be a director, I want to be a senior vice president, I want to be a CEO. They want to be a program manager, or they want to be merely a manager who is comfortable in that situation. So for me, I think, what are the subtle ways in which I can resist that phenomena, and what are the mediums by which I can challenge that in my own life? So thank you so much for sharing that, because I'm very inspired. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you.
have uh, another question over here. Wait, uh, was that a, oh, okay. did you want a response or? Yeah, that was a. Oh, I thought it was a statement. No, 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 no. I mean, I don't, I don't think the, I don't think it's difficult to find um, the means. I think in the post-integration age, the question is, like, what are you willing to sacrifice um, to employ those means? I mean, that's always the question. It's like, you can say something, but then, you know, what repercussions are you willing to weather? Um, and maybe one thing that we can do, uh, which maybe we don't do as well anymore, um, is have our own structures within the community that insulate our individuals or help them deal with that type of pressure. Because like, if you're in a Fortune 500 company out in Silicon Valley, you're probably out on an island. Um, so when they come for you, <laughs> you don't really have anyone standing around and say, okay, we'll guard the door. Right. So, you know, we need to do that. And, you know, I'll say to tie it back in the Black Lives Matter, I mean, you'd be surprised how easy it is to connect into and build a network, you know, through social media. I mean, we were, we were talking about this before the panel, but, you know, in its time, the printing press was kind of like Twitter. Like, it was the thing that allowed information to disseminate, you know, not as fast as Twitter, but, like, relative to what people were doing, you know, a lot faster. So you think about what we can do now, like, are we maximizing the technology in terms of what it can do for us as opposed to what it can do in terms of making money for other people? Um, so I, for me, like, that's, that's the question. Like, everyone's on Twitter, like, and that's great, we're talking, but, like, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that would be one way to build the type of networks where if you did want to take that step and say, you know, no, I'm not going to do this, or no, I'm not going to allow you to um, diminish your potential by choosing the other path, like you have a network of people that you can depend on to sort of weather the blowback, because there will be blowback. I wanted to, um, I'm using my phone not to text or anything, but I had a quote here and I, I didn't want to mess it up, and it's from Desmond Tutu. It very simply says, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. And uh, when I heard that quote, it, it really resonated for me and in the sense of, um, I think sometimes I want, f and I'm not saying this you know, as any sort of insinuation toward you, but I know for myself personally, sometimes I want freedom to be a destination because I'm tired <laughs> and I just want to rest. Because, and especially right now, I feel like it's very exhausting to be black in America right now. And I just have to create these communities of resistance to help strengthen me when I just get so tired of like, whatever it is, the action that I'm doing, you know, if it's mentoring others or being mentored and, and con continuing that relationship because it, it's difficult, it's not easy. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to jump on the love train here of thanking you <laughs> um, for the power of the work that you've done. And I really want to learn how to make this uh, work more accessible to students. Um, I've always been a student of grassroots, kind of bottom-up history and aware of the danger of the top-down, normative, often like feel-good kinds of history. I learned that. Uh, jumping from high school to college history classes and was suddenly like, oh, I didn't know this. I didn't know all of these untold stories. Um, and I recently founded a, a writing program in a publishing house for unheard voices. So we're doing uh, a number of, of books giving voice to kids now. Um, and that's where I was really thinking about. I'm working on a, a memoir and, and poetry collection with students from Baloo High School right now in Southeast DC, and um, giving them a chance to connect to this, to the Black Lives Matter conversation. And it's going to be an Our Lives Matter version. Um, and when working with one student, his first two lines of a piece, and like you, I, I have it on my phone. Um, where you think I'm a menace to society. You think because I come from slavery descent that I can't make greatness my reality. And we stopped there for a little while and talked about that. And we kind of talked about what do you know about your ancestry. And I was just struck by the way he didn't want to talk about it and that he was ashamed of it. Mm -hmm. And I really want to bring him this, this poetry now. But to end on a, on a positive, hopeful note, he ended that stanza with, you say I can't help the world change for good, 
but I correct you critics with the brightness of my future. And I should say, out of the true, true generosity of his heart, uh, Kyle Dargan here has agreed to write the foreword for this book. So look out for it. Yeah, very grateful. Thank you. Uh, well, I think they're recording. Can I respond to her that may be totally off the mark? Is it okay? You know, everybody okay with that? And, you know, I, I, Tony Morrison once said that, I have the quote, and I don't want to pull my phone. We, we, quote, we, can, we can have a quote battle, right? We, right, but it's the, it's the idea that we are always, somebody says that we're not educated, and we got to put 20 pictures on Facebook of an educated black brother. Somebody says we're not, blah, 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 blah. We have to, you know, you're, I was just, why am I concerned about what the people are thinking about me? It's, what do I call myself? You know, I always talk to my students about, like, you don't know what people are saying about you because they're probably not saying it to you. That's what you're projecting, right? What, what do you say about yourself? And walk in that, if that makes sense. You see the kids, and they say I'm a man, menace to society. Well, who is they? Right? Go address they. If it's a person that you know said address them, but don't address them to the point that, well, I, I got to defend who I am. I have to say I'm good, and I've done it with your, with your, my job where I want to prove to everybody that I'm good, and I just had to come to the realization that I don't have to prove I'm good. I'm just going to be good. If I feel good about it at the end of the day, I'm good. So it's just it's about for our children to develop their self-esteem where we're not always trying to counter what the world is saying about us. And right now, I think with the Black Lives Movement, that's kind of what we're going on instead of us. We're being reactive. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a queen. My people, so would they know this poetry and they know this stuff? This is where I come from. You know, it doesn't matter what people say, who, who they say I am. So I, I find our youth, and I taught in D.C. for a year, they were so concerned with everybody else instead of what, 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 what am I saying about myself? Are you saying you're a minister to society? Are you saying you're, what are you saying about yourself and whatever you believe about yourself? Act on that. You know, I think we have to stop. Tony Moore, I, I wish I had a quote now. St we have to stop trying to counter what everybody is saying about us stop define yourself and walk in it because they're always going to be like the kids they always going to be the haters and let them let them hate and don't even hear and that's what i love about our president can we bring him up when they hate on him he keeps walking forward he keep his eye on the prize he got an agenda and i would tell our youth that you keep your eye on your prize and you just go with you go straight to it and it's it's the the, the you know the road from a to z is not straight it's up and down, but it, it leads to your destination eventually. So we can't, if I, if I try to counter everybody who hated on me, I would waste my, I'm wasting my good energy that I can be being productive. Yeah. Worry about my haters. You I know, can't and do it's it. so true. And, and my hope is that, you know, you, we, are, we are all hopeful that because these poems are available digitally, we will share them with the young people that we know, that we will. Because the, the way for our young people to get that self-love is to just know the history. It's really that simple, you know. And when they don't know the history, they don't have it to stand on. And so I, I always say that, you know, my daughter is here. I try to teach her this history from a place of love, not from a place of hate. Um, because I believe that the indignation will come anyway once she sort of grows up and sees the realities. But I don't ever want to project my own... Uh, you know, because I grew up in Memphis, I grew up in the 70s. She's growing up in 2015 in D.C. It's a totally different, you know, she's never known a world without Obama, right? I'm like, you know, she doesn't even know, 9-11 is just a number to her, you know? She wasn't born yet. So, well, she actually, she was born, but she was small. So the point I'm making is that um, I think, you know, one of the wonderful outcomes of, of tonight is, you know, all of these are available digitally, Disseminate, 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 you know? Put, put the link up on your Facebook page, put it up on your Twitter page, whatever. You know, send a text to your grandson, say, hey, have you seen this poem? Um, I, you know, um, I'm gonna send this packet, I'm gonna put it in my purse and send this packet to my nephew and just put it in his face. Hopefully he'll read it, you know? So, yeah. yeah. I just want uh, the young crowd, the young blacks uh, out now, I think it's one word that was in all of these poems they don't have. Hope. All of these people were in dire circumstances. They wrote, uh, wrote these poems, but all of them had hope. Mm -hmm. And the blacks you see now that are in the movement, if they don't have hope, what do they have? Mm -hmm. 
So that, that's, that's the difference between these people and the young. Mm -hmm. And we you have to that. push it. Yes. We have to push it and mm -hmm. tell them that they, if they get that hope, then you can fight it. Yes. Keep their eye on the star. What was the Latin phrase? Uh, <laughs> ik, ik, uh, the literal translation. Seek itur ad aster. Which is seek, seek the star. Seek the star, the path to the stars. Seek the path to the star. Um, in response to you saying that you're tired and you just need to rest, um, I feel sad to see a person that's so young to be to the point that she's just about worn out at times. You have a long way to go and you're going to need a lot of strength to even do the things that you need to do for yourself, let alone your family or anyone else you're responsible for. So with the small amount of energy that I have that I can muster up, I like to send it to you because you're going to need it. Thank it's going to get a lot worse. The more you fight, it's going to get a lot worse before you get a chance to sit down and take a breath. But I'm sad to hear that you're so tired. Thank you. And to add to that, I think that as African Americans, people should not take on those stereotypes and live those stereotypes, such as menace to society. And you did say you're tired, but you are a very successful woman. You are an example for others. And I think you should commend yourself, commend your parents, your grandparents, okay? And though you may feel tired, again, you're an example. So continue to do what you're doing because you are, you are enlightening others. And you, as an example, you are helping others to grow and to achieve. But, and also to the young lady from Silicon Valley. Um, <laughs> she says you're <laughs> <laughs> Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you said you came across a lot of young ladies who said they couldn't be, okay, managers and executives and so on and so forth. Well, open up Ebony, open up Essence. There are a lot of examples, but I just don't think that people need to feed into that, that, they, that stereotype that they cannot. Because as I was telling a young man today, though people may not know it or realize it, there are generations, and as we know, a lot of our HBCUs opened up in the 1860s. And there are a lot of educated, you know, black families that have generations of educated um, individuals. So we have to realize that here in America, there, there are tons of whites who come from working class families and come from working class families today. And there's tons of blacks that come from working class families. And there's tons of blacks that come from generations of education. People are equal. I just don't see it. And I guess I'll just say this from a biracial perspective. I don't always see it in, in a person's mind how they see themselves. I'm like, wait a minute. You have it much better than tons of white people. And um, I just think that. Yes, our media and our society wants to continue to hold African Americans back, and African Americans do not buy into it. There are some that do, but certainly you just got to exert yourself as equals, know that you are entitled to everything and anything, and appreciate the fact that, you know, the achievements and the strides that the African American community has made over the years. Um, if, if I could just say one thing about language as a poet, um, as we're, we're, we're winding up, um, and self-conception. If you are going to share these poems with young people, I think it's really important that you have the conversation around the word slave. Um, it was one of the difficult things for me to keep reading in these poems, to think about the ways that racism sort of psychologically colonizes the mind. And I want to thank you know a writer that I know, a Manny Lewis Obadike, uh, who when I was a student, um, you know, pointed out to me that you know they weren't slaves; they were enslaved people. Mm -hmm. 
and you know, it, it makes a world of difference when you think about your ancestors as slaves, as a state, versus people who were enslaved. They were just like anybody else. It's just someone chose to do this to them. Um, and I think it's important that you know, language is powerful. You know, I, I definitely believe that. And I think, you know, sort of stemming that at that point. You know, the way people throw around that word slave and they say, no, 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 wait a minute, like your ancestors were people. Turn it, you know, they were enslaved. They were not slave. That is not their state. That is not their lot in life. Um, yeah, so. I think we'll take one more, one more question, and then mm -hmm. wrap it up. Okay. I just, can okay. I okay go throw ahead. in another comment. Um, I did research on a book called Sugar of the Crop, and it came out in the '90s. But it was a journalist friend of mine. She interviewed the children of slaves, and this was in the 1990s. So everyone said, "What do you mean? You mean grandchildren or great grandchildren?" She said, "No." I'm interviewing the children of slaves. And one of the things that she discovered in doing this research is what we commonly think of as the slave mentality is really the Jim Crow mentality. And that uh, these people whose parents, much like these writers, were born into slavery and then freed and then had children, they actually didn't possess that sense of being a slave. They actually felt from from the research and the interviews that she did, they actually felt themselves to be independent and to have hope and to um, have opportunity. And it was, I think, only um, later, I think Jim Crow actually was what started to really break black people wow, historically. Wow, interesting. So just wanted let's let's okay. go with our last question. Okay, so it's not exactly a question, but there are a couple of things that I, I noted and that I wanted to kind of connect and that kind of touched me. And one thing was what you said, uh, ma'am, and what you discussed about feeling tired. And I know we talked about that for a while. Um, but ma'am, you said one thing that our generation doesn't have and the, pe the younger people today is hope. Um, and one thing that I would like to point out is that the discrimination and the things that were happening during slave, uh, slave time, slavery times before emancipation and then during Jim Crow times was a lot more out there than what we're dealing with and our generation is dealing with now. So what we're dealing with is much more subtle and it, and it takes a lot of maneuvering and mental uh, strategizing and you have to you kind of think, sit back and think about something before you even realize that you are being you know, judged or discriminated against and things like that. And that's why we get so tired, tired so soon. And I, and I would like to say to you, we, we do have hope. Um, and then going even further back in the conversation, there was, uh, I can't remember who said it, but someone mentioned that uh, we talked about the the leaders and how, you know, he thought that the younger generations would be so proud and, and praise. And, and a lot of people think that we don't have that, and we do. Um, but I would also say, you know, there, somebody brought up the Oprah thing. Um, I think there are leaders in today's movement um, I think one thing that's very important is for the, the elder generation and the, the younger generations to, to find some common ground to learn to respect each other, to learn to collaborate, um, and for the elders to feel like they can teach us and then pass the baton. And I think um, a lot of elders are still trying to hold on to the baton, and, and I understand why, you know, it's the, you, you got to fight that fight, you know, it's a good fight. Um, but I think that at some point we feel like we want to be, we want to be cultivated, and then be able to feel like that we can go out there and we can do the good work. And there are certain things um, you, you mentioned Twitter, and there are certain things, social media, and all types of strategies that we can come up with and things that we can also offer that I feel like a lot of time is not valued. Um, and so that that's just my what I wanted to contribute, and it was. Really weighing on. I'm so glad we're ending on this. Thank you so much for reminding us of, you know, looking forward to the future, passing the baton, and keeping the struggle going. I, I'm so glad. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, you're just a wonderful, wonderful group. Thank you. Thank you.